Welcome, everyone. Good to see you all here. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, but for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Connor. I've been interning here the last couple of weeks. Uh, thank you for all coming to the Lunch and Learn. Uh, Ted, this is your fourth? I believe us? so. This is Ted's fourth Lunch and Learn. Ted is an independent video producer out of Beverly, uh, and he's going to talk to us today about the DSLR and camcorders and the differences between them and when you should use each. Right. right. Take it away, Ted. Excellent. Okay. Thanks for showing up, and um, welcome to one of the more esoteric discussions that we've presented here. And it actually, it, it applies to a lot of different things because everybody's been probably aware. If you're if you're involved in producing video or doing any kind of video project, you probably are very well aware of the fact that um, digital SLRs are sort of the hot new video tool. I mean, the fact what really makes them amazing is a number of things, and we'll get into those. But um, for a lot of the capabilities of this camera and the video camcorder are the same. Believe it or not, there's, there's a lot of video technology packed into this thing. It's designed initially to be a still camera, but you can use it also as a video camera and get some pretty good results as, as a result. But um, what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is basically why would you use one and not the other or one over the other. So I've got a quick little PowerPoint presentation here. And one of the first things you should do is, when you're considering any project, you should consider, first of all, what are you shooting and how are you trying to get this across? What are you, is, are you telling a story? Are you doing a portrait of somebody? Are you shooting something that has a lot of action in it? Are you shooting something that's a lot of um, landscapes and architectural stuff and things like that. And that, that'll kind of get you thinking about what's the visual style going to be for what you're doing. And also, where are you shooting? I mean, are you, are you going to be showing it on Cape Ann TV? Is this something that's going to go on to a website? Is this something that's going to be presented on a big screen at a meeting or something? It, these are all things you need to be able to consider in terms of being able to get the right kind of picture going for what your final project is. And the other question, one of the more important questions is third one, how are you shooting it? And that, what, by that I mean, are you working with other people or are you trying to do something all on your own? If you're doing something all on your own, what you usually want to be able to do is keep your equipment package as lightweight as possible, as simple as possible, and make sure that you're up to date in terms of how the thing works and how you can get the best results out of it. Now last time we did a little seminar on how to get the most out of your camcorder and there are a lot of things that are in the menu there that will make a difference in terms of being able to control the picture and the sound. Same thing goes with the digital SLR. It's got a lot of controls, a lot of things built into the menu, but what you should really be considering is how are you going to be doing this, this project? What are you going to be shooting? You know, how long are you going to be shooting? Because there are a number of things to consider. And one of the things I'll get into is how long you can shoot for. And that has two different, two different variables. So, seven questions when you're considering use a camcorder or use a digital SLR. Do you want a large or small picture sensor? We'll get into that. How long do you want to be able to record? How much control do you want to have over the focus? Do you want to be able to control the aperture? That's your iris on your lens. Um, how easily do you want to do that? Do you want to have it automatic? Or do you want to have sort of immediate control because whatever you're shooting is changing a lot? Ergonomics pertains a lot to, you know, what do you, how are you handling the camera? Where's it going to be? Is it going to be on a tripod on your shoulder? How much control over audio do you want? And also, how much money have you got to spend on this thing? So the first thing we'll get into, and this is something we talked about before in the iPhone thing, but it's, it's good to be able to review. The sensor is essentially the light capturing chip that's inside the, both cameras. Now, this camera here, the Rebel, has a has an image, if you want to compare the two, it's about an inch in diameter across. It's a little bit more than an inch, actually, because the Nikon one-inch sensor is this. This is what, this is the size, anyway, of the sensor chip that's in there. Now, if you've come up from 
still photography using film. You know how wide and how big a 35 millimeter negative is. And this is, the full frame is darn close to what a 35 millimeter film frame is. Down here, we're looking, I'm in the way. Here, you've got, this is the sensor, these two boxes sort of represent the sensor that's in this camera. So you can, you know, if you take this and put it next to here, you see you've got a much larger surface area to be able to collect light. That makes a big difference in two ways. The smaller the sensor, the wider the lens is. And the wider the lens is, the more depth of field you've got. If you look at this picture of these pencils here, you've got, you know, practically all of them are in focus. Shallow depth of field means you can pick out one thing that's in focus and make it blurry. And if we can get this. The thing about the big sensors, because you've got more, more surface area, the lens, here we go. Where are we all are? All right, so if we look over here, If you notice, you can, you can make this, this very much in focus. In fact, the more you do that, you can make this part in focus, but this part out of focus. Or you can make this part in focus and that part out of focus. Now, those are only about six, eight inches apart from each other. But if you want, if you're shooting, say you're shooting a portrait and you want to be able to have the background go out of focus. Digital SLR camera is what you want for that because it's got the larger sensor, which means you need to use a longer lens, a longer focal length lens. Regular wide angle on this lens here is about six millimeters or something like that. Wide angle on this is about 14 millimeters. So just because of the different sizes of the lenses, you can get a more selective focus of you know, what's, what's in focus, what's out of focus. So similar to the shots of the pencils here, you can pick out one thing that you want to have your eye or the audience's eye go to. And by doing that, they can you know, really create a much different narrative because if you, really if you want to be able to isolate something from its background or isolate something in the foreground away from what's going on in back, this is the camera to be able to use. Using a camcorder, you can still kind of get that effect, but only on a really long telephoto zoom. And sometimes that just isn't convenient. You know, you can't stand 30 feet back from the person you're interviewing and expect them to feel comfortable with it. The other thing to consider with a larger sensor size here is that the more real estate you've got in the camera to be able to capture light, the more light you can capture without having to have to boost the gain on the thing. In a camcorder, you can really record down to a certain amount of light, and then below that, it starts getting really grainy and really noisy. If you're shooting in a situation where there isn't a lot of light, digital SLR is really good for that because it's got the larger sensor. It's much better in lower light. So that's the other thing to consider. Now, because digital SLRs weren't designed to shoot video, they can only process so much video data at a time. And in some cameras, that's only 12 minutes. Other cameras can record up to almost 30 minutes of, of video, but then it stops. So if you're in the middle of an interview, and you're up to like 29 minutes, and they're getting just to the greatest part of their story, the last thing you want is for your camera to stop right in the middle of recording. So if you're shooting an interview and you know you won't be able to control when you can stop and start, like sometimes if you're shooting at a conference and the, the speakers are just going and you have no idea when they're going to break or anything like that, if you're able to make sure you've got enough recording time, go with the camcorder. Especially this one, because it's got places for two slots, so you can record for hours and hours actually without having to stop recording. So that's the other one of the limitations. The other thing 
to remember is you have to pay really close, because it's a shallow depth of field and because you have a lot of ability to be able to select what's in focus, that means there are a lot of things that will be out of focus when you're shooting, which means you have to be really careful. Sometimes just using the little viewfinder on the back isn't enough to be able to let you know. Now you can magnify the pictures that you've got in there. Let's see if we can get this going again. Do. This button here magnifies the picture so you can really sort of get critical with how exact your focus is. You can blow it up even more to really be sure. And when you go back to that, you'll know that at least that little area there is going to be in focus. And then you can sort of fish around and try out the other things and see what that's going to be in. But you've got to be really careful. So a lot of times when I'm shooting with a digital SLR, that's why I bring a big monitor so I can really see what's in focus, what's in the frame, what's not. Sometimes it's hard to tell. The other thing about focus is if you're going to go automatic, say you're shooting a soccer game. Folks are running towards the camera, away from the camera, all over the place. If you try to manually focus, that can be tough. And a lot of times you want to have, you know, sort of a long lens on your camera while you're shooting action, just because that's how you can fill the frame with people. So you have to be careful in terms of what you're focusing on. With a camcorder, the autofocus is fairly precise. And because you've got shallower depth of field, you've got a little bit of leeway there in terms of error, how much is going to be in focus, how much is not. And so for act, shooting action, a lot of times you'll find out that this is better. But this, the new digital SLRs, this is a few years old. The brand new version of the Rebel has a um, really good autofocus feature. The problem is, is the motor that controls the iris for this thing makes noise. So if you're recording audio, with the camera, you're going to hear the autofocus motor go zzz, 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 a lot. With this, the motor makes no noise. So if you're just using the microphones that are built into the camera, then you're better off being able to use this. Sometimes, though, you really want to have the, the shallow depth of field. You want to be able to pick out people just as they're you know, kind of running up and down the field. So you know, if you have a friend that can help you out, have them shooting with this as well. Cut the two together. The thing to remember about all of this is that in the end, if you've got the time, you want to be able to manually focus stuff. And one of the things professionals use on a digital SLR is a follow focus rig. And what this is is basically a knob on a rig that goes under the lens with a gear that controls the focus ring in the front. This way you can really accurately set, like, you know, if you know somebody's, if you've got a scripted scene and you know someone's going to, walk in from a door and then go sit down. You can set the focus for the door and then as you pan over here to have, as they sit down, you can follow, you can track the focus with the knob there and it's got really good control that way to be able to keep the image in focus but also um, know that you're, you're hitting the marks because you've got this ring here. You can use a, a grease pencil or a pen or even a piece of tape and you can mark one, you know, position A and then position B. A lot of times, that's what the focus puller guys, that, I mean, if you ever watched movie credits, there'll be the camera crew and there's the, you know, camera operator, second camera, focus puller. Focus puller is the guy who sits next to the camera and manually focuses the thing, which is great if you've got a crew, but if you're just doing it by yourself, you've got to find some ways that are going to, you know, work around that. So, Focusing, just in a nutshell, focusing is much more critical with a digital SLR than it is with a camcorder. You can use autofocus on both, but this is quicker in terms of, you know, again, if you're going to try to get, do stuff on your own and you want to be able to have the camera do the thinking for you, the camcorder is still the better bet.
when you're shooting outside, sometimes the scene is just way too bright and you need to be able to control the amount of light that's, you know, hitting the sensor inside the camera. With a digital SLR, you've got to basically buy a neutral density filter, either a really dark one, medium dark or something like that, to cut down on the amount of light. Two reasons you want to be able to cut down the amount of light. One, just so that it's not overexposed. Because if you've, you know, you get up to f22 and it's still too bright, what a lot of people will do sometimes is increase the shutter speed. So usually on, when you're shooting video, you try to shoot at about a 60th of a second. When you're shooting anything faster than that, you start getting a strobing effect. Um, if you ever saw the film Saving Private Ryan, when they hit the beach and the bullets are flying and all this other stuff, they shot that at a really high shutter speed, like at about a 500th of a second, which what that does is every single frame of video is like this frozen image. So you get this really sort of hyper sharp, really, you know, almost frozen time kind of look, which can be okay if you want that kind of effect. But most video, you want to have just a, li a little bit of blur. So how do you control the amount of light if you can't increase the shutter speed? You put a neutral density filter on it. Now, camcorders, most of them, even little ones like this, have a built-in neutral density filter. You can either manually activate it or it'll automatically activate itself. So that's something else to consider. That's just another thing that you have to be able to walk around with with your digital SLR if you're going to try to be able to shoot in as many different lighting situations as possible. Next. All right. A lot of this is one of the this is one of the areas where there's the biggest amount of difference between the two cameras. This is designed to be a still camera. You know, this is basically designed for you to hold on a second. You know, it was designed so you go here, you shoot a picture, then you walk over to another place and shoot a picture. It's really not made for you to move with or to hold on to for an extended period of time. You know, if you try to shoot an event with a camera like that and you're trying to shoot video without any kind of support, without a tripod. It's going to, your arm's going to get tired after a while. Even though they don't weigh a hell of a lot, it's still a, it's still a problem. So what a lot of people will do is if they you know, are in a situation where they don't have a tripod, a little rig like this, again with a follow focus, but it, what it basically does, the camera mounts on this bracket and you've got two handles that you can hold on to and a thing that rests on your shoulder. This does two things. One, it takes, you know, it, it takes the weight off of just your hands in front, but what it also do is it does is it helps stabilize the camera. The thing to remember with the digital SLR is because it's got such a huge sensor, sometimes, especially if you're moving the camera, you'll start getting this distortion that happens. It's called the jelly effect. And what it is is basically the top of the sensor is seeing something in a slightly different position than the bottom of the sensor is in that particular case. So if you're like moving the camera like this, sometimes things will distort and stretch. So you have to be watching that out. So you try to keep the cam try to keep the digital SLR as steady as possible. The way to do it is either on a tripod or use this rig here. The camcorder, however, this thing, first of all, it's lightweight. Secondly, you can hold it in your in two hands like this. It's designed to be held with two hands. And some of the larger ones have a shoulder mount built into them. You can also get a shoulder mount bracket for one of these things, and it makes it rock solid. You can really just shoot all day with the thing on your shoulder and get just really reliably steady stuff. And that's very important when you're shooting in telephoto, because if you go with a long lens and you're moving the camera a lot, you just get a jiggly image that you just can't use. So this, again, the steadier, the better. You got a lot better chance of holding this one steady. Next. And this is one that, this is something we'll probably do a workshop on in the, in the future. Recording audio on one of these cameras, I mean, this is, is sort of an afterthought. You know, they, they basically built it, they built a, um, 
a microphone jack into the camera, but you got no way of monitoring the sound. Anybody who's used a camcorder knows that you can watch, you can control the levels of the microphones that you're either plugging in or you're using in the front here with the controls on top. And then you can adjust one side to be louder than the other or not, but you can at least adjust the volume. With this, there's no way to be able to monitor, there's no VU meters. There's no sound level monitoring on this thing. You can't even plug in a headphone to this. What they do is they build little boxes that add on, that you know, clip onto the top, onto the hot shoe, or screw on underneath to the tripod mount. You plug the microphones into there. You can also plug in your headsets into that. And then that, says, that sends a mixed sing, signal into the camera, which as long as you trust what the camera is doing, that's fine, but you got no way of knowing, is the camera recording sound? And if so, is it the right level or anything like that? So what a lot of people will do is record audio. If you're doing pictures with this, you're recording audio on a separate device, either an audio recorder or even a camcorder that has you know, audio controls. The other thing that you have to do when you do that is when you get into editing, you have to sync up all your pictures and sound before you can start editing. You know, so that takes more time. So it's got to be worth it to you to use the image advantages of the digital SLR um, over the camcorder if you're dealing with sound. If you're just shooting stuff that you're going to just add music to later or it doesn't matter what the, the audio is doing in front of you, then, you know, fine. You could probably get adequate sound with the built-in microphone, which is really crappy, but, you know, sometimes that's enough. But if you want to do good sound, and especially if you're recording voice, if you're doing an interview seriously, you need some other way to be able to capture audio, which this has built in. So that's one of the bigger differences between the two. Then, if you compare the cost of, say, the Rebel T2i, which they don't make anymore, but at the time, this was about a you know, $600 camera. The XF105 is almost $3,000. You can say, well, why spend all that money when I can shoot video with this? Well, we've talked about what the differences are, some of the stuff that you're going to be handicapped in trying to do with shooting with a digital SLR versus you've got everything happening with this. I mean, the camcorder is built to shoot video, record sync sound with it, to be able to have control over the picture and sound. This was primarily designed as a still device that also shoots video. And if you understand the limitations and you can work with it, you can get some great results. But if you consider the six or $700 digital SLR, then a shoulder rig like this costs like another 500 bucks. Lenses, I mean, one of the great things about the digital SLR is you can swap out the lenses. You can use different lenses, but those cost money. If you want to use a zoom on this, the big problem you've got is a lot, of, a lot of cameras, a lot of lenses for digital SLRs, as you zoom, the focus changes as well. Lenses built for a camcorder um, don't change focus. You can zoom in on something that it'll stay sharp. You can zoom out, it'll stay sharp. With this, you can lose focus while you're zooming. The other problem with this is the lenses are not designed to change the f-stop. On a camcorder, actually with any lens, the more, you, if you zoom, with a zoom lens, pardon me, if you zoom out wide, that's the widest f-stop you've got. And a lot of times when you buy a lens, it's, oh, it's a, it's a uh, 2.8. Well, it's a 2.8 when it's wide. When it's a telephoto, it's like a 5.6. So you're losing two stops of light when you go to telephoto. What you want to be able to do is keep a standard f-stop so you don't have to ride the f-stop while also while you're zooming. And the other thing is, is a motorized zoom lens for this camera costs about $12,000. So, you know, it, again, what do you want to be able to do with it? If you're doing a lot of stuff that you're not zooming, that you're just going to keep the camera on a fixed focal length, this will be fine. But if there is some reason you want to be able to zoom, again, if you're shooting sports, if you're shooting something that you want to be able to, you know, f change the frame area while you're shooting, um, either shooting, uh, you know, landscapes, some stills, or something like that. You're better off with this because you can adjust the speed of the motor, of the zoom, 
and you don't have to worry about the exposure changing. So if you figure, you know, to be able to make this do what that can do in a lot of cases, because, you know, also buying the, uh, the audio adapter that will make it possible for you to be able to plug in microphones with professional, you know, three-pin XLR jacks into this, you don't, you know, you're going to spend more money. You could probably, you could buy your, you know, $700 camera and then find yourself spending another $2,000 on accessories so that you can actually go out and shoot on the shoulder with it, whereas this thing is set up and ready to go for about that same price. So, again, it's what you want to do, how much you want to do with it, and do you have any help, you know? So that's basic, those are the ground rules for, for this thing, and I've got a few more minutes for questions from anybody who has them. Do the larger, more expensive full frame cameras give you more options? They do. They have a lot more, um, there are a lot more menu settings. And again, you know, the problem you've got with this is anytime you want to change anything, you've got to go into the menu. With a video camera, you've got a lot of settings that are just available as buttons, either on the lens, on the camera itself, volume controls up here. Practically all of that stuff, you have to go into the menu, which means in most cases you have to stop shooting. You can't start changing stuff on this while you're still rolling. To be able to get into the menu, a lot of times you have to be able to turn off the camera, go into the menu, make the adjustments, and do all that other stuff, whereas a camcorder's got the buttons. The, uh, like the, the Canon 5D Mark IV that just came out has got all kinds of great stuff, shoots in low light just perfectly, shoots 4K video, but it still doesn't have any way to be able to handle those controls without going into the menu. So, again, it's, it's for the style of shooting you're, you're doing. If you're doing a lot of documentary stuff where you can't control what's happening, you want something that's more flexible and more, you know, ready to go, the camcorder will be, you know, probably your better choice. But if you're shooting something that's set up, like say you're shooting a TV commercial, you've got actors and you've got sets and you can light everything and really take your time in terms of setting up the shot and pulling it off, then this is great. You know, this is wonderful. I mean, this is, this is probably the easiest way to get into the game to make really high quality video pictures for the least amount of money. So, you know, yes, it's got more feet. These things have more features, but they still aren't video cameras. Ted, what type, what megapixels are, would you be looking for to get the best out of what you're looking to do? This is about this. Uh, the new, the new Canon Rebel is like a 28 megabyte, yeah, um, sensor, whereas this is about a six megabyte sensor. So what that means again is if you're going to uh, shoot in low light, you're going to try to boost the sensitivity of the sensor by changing the ISO or the gain. The larger the sensor, the less noise you'll have. But um, with something like that, I mean, you can, because you can get decent video pictures with a six megabyte, you know, megapic, pardon me, a six megapixel sensor, um, because you're, show, you're, you're looking at 30 frames a second, you're not looking at just a still frame. If you're looking at one still frame, you want to have the maximum amount of information. That's why digital SLRs have these giant sensors, because you want to have good quality. But if you're, sh if you're showing 30 frames a second, a lot of the grain, a lot of the noise and stuff like that just isn't noticeable because it's video. So a smaller sensor, you know, uh, works just fine in video. A larger sensor is great in the low light or if you want to have the shallow depth of field. But that's the, the real thing to think about now, because you can, get, you can get great still photos with a 12 megapixel camera. You can, um, you can blow it up pretty big, stuff like that, but you know, if you want to be able to shoot video, you need to be able to have the flex, your camera's got to be flexible enough to be able to be responsive to the situation that you're in. So megapixels, you know, for shooting HD, uh, a 10 or 11 megapixel camera is fine. You know, is, is more than adequate for high quality stuff. Effects on each unit, temperature and moisture. Ah, that depends on who built it. You know, the, uh, like both Panasonic and Canon make high quality cameras. Most of them are good in average situations. But if you're going to go out on a boat, if you're going to go on a canoe trip, if you're going to shoot out in the rain, 
if you're shooting in the snow or if you're out in the desert with the, the, the sands blowing all over the place, you want to put an extra housing on top of either of these cameras just because that's the fastest way to kill a camera is just to let it get moist or let grit and dirt get into the stuff, especially the focus, you know, the focusing rings, the zoom rings, anything that mechanically operates here has spaces where stuff can get in and that's where you can, you know, kill your camera. So um, there are a couple of camcorders that are made to be used under those conditions, you know, under high humidity or where water's splashing and stuff like that. I mean, one of the best things is the GoPro, you know, because you get a little plastic housing that's totally waterproof. You can throw it into the ocean and, you know, it'll keep working. With these things, you really need to be able to put either, you know, a raincoat over them or get an underwater housing or some super sealed thing that'll keep all the junk out, you know, keep the, keep the elements out. Are these, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. no, we're bouncing back. Kind of a spin off on that. Yeah. Capable of being shooting fresh water, salt water underneath. Right. You need underwater housing. Good. Yeah, definitely. Will the SLR shoot at 60 frames per second? The, the, some of them will. This one, actually, the, the new Rebel will shoot, will shoot at 60 frames per second. Actual. Yeah, no, I think, no, 30, 30 is, is more than adequate. Um, 60 is good. If you shoot at 60, 60 frames a second, if, if you know you're going to be shooting slow-mo, then you shoot at 60. Some, some of these cameras actually shoot up to 120 frames per second, depending. I mean, I think it's the, the new Mark IV will, will shoot that. No, it'll, it'll shoot 90 frames per second. It won't do the full 120 frames a second. But it's amazing that, you know, Canon hasn't put more into making that happen. Sony's version of this, which is actually not a, a reflex camera, but a mirrorless reflex camera, has a full frame sensor that you can use up to, I think it's ISO 200,000. You know, you could, you could shoot something in the back of this room here and it'll look great. And um, it's got, it's, it's also got a lot of, to address your point, Dave, it's, a, it's got a lot of uh, seals on the thing that will prevent the moisture and the dirt and stuff like that from coming in. But um, to shoot slow motion, a lot of camcorders are better set up for doing that. This one goes up to 60 frames per second, but you can also, there, there's a newer version of this that shoots 120 frames per second without having to do anything special to it. The Sony uh, A7S also shoots up to 120 frames per second, and it has the advantage of the large sensor. Okay. So, so a lot of people are switching. A lot of people who adapted Canon technology because they said, okay, this is, I can use all my Canon lenses, and it's got the big sensor, and you've got really high-quality pictures, are now moving over to Sony because Sony's got an even better way of being able to record video. So as people are using their still cameras to record more video, You'll see the manufacturers changing. This is, you know, uh, this is this is something that's really only about eight or nine years old. Using a digital SLR as a video camera, and as each one of these Canon cameras comes out, it's more and more suited for shooting video. Sony designed their camera from the bottom up to be able to shoot video, and a lot of other manufacturers are doing it. Ryko has one, Pentax has one now, so you're going to see more cameras coming onto the market lower price, high quality, and with more features. So what I do is rent. <laughs> I mean, basically, you know, if you've got, you know, if you've got, um, you know, a job that someone's paying you to do, especially, rent, rent, a, rent a camera that's exactly perfect for the job. If you want to be able to have the flexibility, get a membership at Cape Ann TV. We got this camera available, that camera available, and a few other things as well. So. And the way to really know which, which one is best is to try it out. Try it out on a project of your own. Go out and shoot with this and see what it can do, what it can't do. Go out with the camcorder, really learn what the menu features are good for, and you'll get a really good idea of what this is best for and what this is best for. But um, hopefully what I discussed today will give you an idea of things to think about when you're considering what kind of camera to use and that your project will benefit. Okay? Right. One more. On lens quality. Yes. Uh, there are good lenses. Yes. Lesser than good 
And the, the thing about the camcorder is that the lens is built into it. You can't change the lens. You can put an adapter on the front so you can get a more wide angle effect or increase the telephoto thing. The thing about the digital SLR is you can change the lenses. You can get some really good lenses for this camera. In fact, what I did is I bought up a whole bunch of still lenses before digital SLRs started catching on and got some adapters for them so I could put them on my Canon camera. And now the, the older lenses that used to go for like you know, 50 bucks each at a used camera store are going for like 250 bucks because you know, as more and more people get these things, they say, oh, I want to try out a different lens. You know? So the old lenses that used to only go on the film cameras are now popular because you can put them on this thing as well. So um, that's the other thing is you got a lot of flexibility in terms of what kind of glass you can put on your camera, which you don't have with that. All right, that's it for today. Okay. Thanks for coming. Okay. What kind of cards go in this? CF. I just bought five SD cards that don't fit anything. I ordered the wrong ones. Oh, you're kidding. And I can't send them back. Oh.